Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I have been doing for a while now. The first Sunday of every month, I actually do a, a subscriber Sunday video where subscribers send in photos of things in their yard that they're proud of. That video is actually next weekend, the first Sunday of February. If you're interested in sending in photos for that, send them to this email address here and just label the email subscriber photos or something like that so that I can find them. Uh, and uh, that will be very helpful for me. But that video goes up next Sunday, and then after that I'll get back to the question and answer videos the rest of the month on the Sundays. Uh, I had a good amount of questions from uh, last week, uh, and I went back and grabbed a couple from the, uh, the video from two weeks ago as well. So uh, let's go ahead and get started on them. Uh, somebody asked me about using their seed starting mix as potting soil. If you have extra seed starting mix after you start your vegetable seeds or whatever you're doing with that, or microgreens. I, I use a seed starting mix for my microgreens and for my uh, seed starting in the house. The main difference between a seed starting mix and a potting soil is the potting soil is going to have something added to it for drainage. And so most of the time that's going to be perlite. Uh, and uh, you can go and buy a little bag of perlite and blend that into your leftover seed starting mix. Maybe a third perlite, something like that to create some additional drainage. If you use the seed starting mix as it is as potting soil, it could potentially keep your plants to uh, too waterlogged because um, it is really, really good at holding on to water. So uh, that would be the way to convert it um, to a potting soil. Uh, somebody asked me about controlling moss um, in their lawn, and the main key with, mo uh, with controlling moss is going to be drainage. Uh, I know that most of the time you're going to read that you need to lime it, you need to raise the pH, and that will help, but moss is, will surprisingly grow even with neutral pH, not as well um, as in, a, in, an, in an acid soil because it, it won't have the nutrients available to it that it needs, most likely iron. Iron's readily available with a low pH, so I imagine that it really likes uh, soils where it can access iron more easily, but you'll still, you can still have moss with a neutral pH. I think the main issue is drainage. Uh, in that space and making sure the soil drains. And you can get a core aerator uh, and aerate that space. You can aerate it anytime. You don't have to do it in the fall or any set period of time. You can go rent an aerator now. I had a soccer field uh, years ago that uh, we deep core aerated. And then we put out some sand, uh, some, pl some dry play sand uh, over the field and allowed that sand to uh, be raked into those holes where the, co where the core aerator had pulled out plugs. And that sand created some kind of permanent drainage in that soccer field. It, it was originally graded properly and it had just kind of sunk down over time and was, it was kind of flat. So it just didn't drain well. But that deep core aeration and then where the plugs come out of the ground filled with sand works pretty well. And I think that would be an effective strategy if I was trying to eliminate some, uh, some uh, moss would be, like I say, aerate it, throw out some dry sand out there, use a wide rake and uh, try to get it to fall into those holes. And I think you would have some success. It's gonna take time, everything takes time. And you probably do need to lime it. It probably is an indicator that the pH is too low as well. Um, somebody asked me about fertilizing and pruning drift and knockout roses. And uh, it definitely is time to prune them. I went past the Raleigh Rose Garden yesterday and all the roses have been pruned at this point. So uh, I would definitely prune them. I might wait a week or two or four even to fertilize them. Uh, but uh, it's definitely time to prune them. I did walk past another group of knockout roses yesterday that were covered in rose rosette. I'll put that, I'm gonna put that picture up on Instagram today. If you follow me on Instagram, you can see that photo of what rose rosette looks like. Uh, and uh, they were in pretty bad shape. So uh, just be mindful to prune your own drift roses and knockout roses and your own roses and clean your tools in between and that kind of thing. It's actually spread by an aerified mite, but I think that you could definitely uh, move it around uh, with your tools as well. Um, let's see, somebody asked me about when the best time to transplant a Japanese maple would be, and definitely while it's dormant now um, would, be, it would be a great time to do it. Uh, if it's an old, really established one, uh, you can use my technique. I, I prepped a large plant uh, to move uh, in a video maybe a year and a half ago or so. It was a large camellia, and I went actually through and broke and cut the roots around it and left it in place. So I basically um, created it, a, a little pot for it. And I went through a couple times during the year and just continued to cut around it and made all the roots kind of centered. And then I popped it out of the ground the next winter. And so that's a uh, possibility if it's a large one. But if it's been planted in the last four or five years, I'd move it now while it's dormant. Uh, somebody, uh, so, oh, somebody, I should have never gotten involved in this milk jug 
uh, <laughs> milk jug seed seed thing because when I when I said something about it uh, the last uh, la last week and, and I've got a lot of comments back on it. Somebody pointed out that uh, slower growing uh, things that you could start early would be a good idea to go ahead and start like perennials. And so when I said it's too early to start most of your spring and summer flowers that person was accurate if it's a slower growing thing if you went to a nursery right now that did annuals and perennials like a, a nursery that did all color they would definitely already have their perennials in implanted because most of those things like let's just say as an example uh, echinacea or black-eyed susans or something like that those things are definitely much slower from seed uh, in order to get flowers on them the first year you would have to, you would want to go ahead and seed those things so that's accurate annual flowering things is what I had in my mind when I was talking about it, about waiting a little while and tomatoes and peppers and all those kinds of things. So there probably are some things that you could be starting from seed, flowering things, mostly perennial type flowers. And then somebody asked me, I talked about it being difficult or I would not want to tear, be tearing the plants apart, you know, in that milk jug technique where you're putting all the plants together. And then they pointed out that in my propagation videos in the past, I had propagated into trays, like open trays like that. But those are woody shrubs, and they're going to be much easier to pull apart um, than the annual, you know, little pepper plants and that kind of thing are going to be much more fragile pulling them apart. So that's the difference, really. But my, you know, propagating a woody shrubs in an open tray like that, you know, I can kind of pull on those and not, you know, not worry about hurting them as I separate them. Uh, as opposed to, you know, vinca or something, you know, some sort of annual flower. Uh, that's, that's my thought on that. Um, somebody asked me about their ground cover uh, sedum not flowering uh, very well. There are a lot of those ground cover sedums that are just not, they were not bred to flower. They do flower, they all flower, but um, uh, some of them were just not, uh, they were, they're picked because of the gold foliage or their ground cover habit, that kind of thing. They have not been selected for their flowering, although there are some really good flowering ground cover sedums. My guess is whatever variety you have, and there's probably 300 of them, if I had to take a guess. Uh, I, I just, you know, if you'll see me in these tour videos, I'm like, there's another ground cover sedum and there's another ground cover sedum. I don't, you know, I don't, th there's a lot of varieties. And so uh, I would uh, I would think that you got one that was, that was originally picked for its foliage and not so much for its flowers. Uh, as opposed to like upright seed them that have the big, beautiful, showy pinks and you know that kind of thing. Uh, somebody asked me about pruning their coral bark maple, said they had some whips on it. I actually walked past one yesterday. Coral bark maples do tend to have you know kind of uh, limbs up at the top. The, the end of the season growth from last year just kind of comes up and over and, and just kind of is a wispy growth on the top of it. You could definitely get those under control in the winter time. You can take them back two or three you know, two or three feet and just kind of, you know, you know, even out the top of the plant again. And this would be the time uh, to do that for sure. Um, somebody asked me about using uh, their, their pH of their soil is like eight and they want and they're growing strawberries and strawberries like an, a slightly acid soil um, or pretty acidic soil, around 5.5, something like that. Um, and asked me about using some sort of soil acidifier and you can definitely use a fertilizer for acid loving plants. Uh, and you can use uh, sulfur, you know, to lower the pH as well. But those things aren't permanent. You know, so adding sulfur to the soil, sulfur can lower the pH, but it will not lower the pH permanently. It's, it will just, it, it will slowly but surely just creep back up. You can test it. Same thing with lime when you're trying to raise the pH. You can, farmers don't add lime once and then they're done adding lime. The pH actually settles back down again over time. And so they have to relime it every few years. They're getting it tested every year, and some and they're reliming. So it's not a permanent fix. If you wanted to really f grow strawberries long term in soil that was eight, I would grow them in containers or grow them in raised beds where you can uh, have a little more control of you know and use bark mix um, as or peat peat based mix or a pine bark mix. Pine bark being better. Um, to grow your strawberries in a raised bed. I think that's more effective long term. Otherwise, you're going to be constantly trying to lower that pH because, like I say, it's always going to try to creep back up. Uh, that's just that's the, that's the way it works. Um, 
Somebody asked me about where I got where to get strawberry plants. I actually got mine from Gurney's last year, the ones I had in the other house. I brought them here. They're actually in a pot over here that I haven't replanted them yet. I dug them, dug some of them up on the way out, but gurneys.com uh, is where I got mine last year. Somebody asked me about pruning grasses, and it's definitely time to, 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 to prune your grasses at this point, especially in the south. In the north, you can wait a little while longer if you want to, but uh, it is time to go ahead and, and take them off. I'm putting up the February what to do in February video toward the end of this next week. And it will definitely include, it's time to prune your grasses back. And uh, you wanna get that done before the new growth starts uh, to come up in the middle of them. Otherwise it's a lot harder to do. Right now you can just off with their head, you know, leave, leave them up a little higher than, you know, most people do. <laughs> you know, leave them up about six inches or so for sure, maybe a little more than that. Uh, and then, um, Somebody asked me about when to plant hellebores, and I think you could do it almost any time. They're, they're really, really rugged plants. In zone five, and they are hardy in the zone five, and some I think in the zone four, uh, they tend to be more herbaceous, meaning they tend to die completely to the ground, whereas I'm in zone seven B, and hellebores are evergreen here. And uh, we've had winters, would have knocked them back a little more, but for the most part, they're evergreen here. Um, and so, those of you in areas where they're evergreen, I'd go ahead and plant them. Now, a tricky part to this question is, if you go and shop for hellebores right now, you're gonna see they're in full flower and they have lots of new growth on them. They likely came out of a house. And uh, so be careful with that. And through January and February, if you're buying plants that have a lot of new growth on them, in all likelihood, they were kept warm uh, in some sort of house. And uh, buy them, but don't plant them, because if you do, or buy them, plant them, and be prepared to cover them because that new growth is going to get hurt for sure. So always keep that in mind this time of year. Any, any plants you're shopping for, if you have a ton of new growth or they're flowering at an unusual time, I would not stick them out there in the yard until after you've passed your uh, frost-free date or get closer to your frost-free date. Uh, otherwise, those plants are potentially going to, uh, to get damaged. So that's the list of questions from this week. Uh, like I say, ask questions down below. Two weeks from now, there'll be another question and answer video. And uh, next week is the subscriber Sunday video. Thanks for watching.